Um, Annie, uh, what a terrific conversation, and I'm excited to move on and start diving into some of the resources today. So with that, um, I will ask my colleagues Celine Marquez, um, Ernest Moy, and Bray Patrick Lake to join me on stage. Um, <laughs> on stage, it all seems a little silly that we continue to use this uh, in-person language. Annie and I were joking about not tripping on our way up to the stage earlier. Um, before, uh, before we go ahead and dive in, there's actually a really terrific question in the chat that I would be remiss if I didn't address. There's a really good question asking us to define digital health measurements. Um, that does seem important in the context of our conversations today. So when we talk about digital health measurement, we are thinking about the use of sensors and other digital generated data to provide information about someone's health. It's really important as we think about the history of Data CC that we didn't, for example, select the remote patient monitoring collaborative community or even the remote patient monitoring. Both of those terms infer that the center and the locus of all activity is the clinic or the trial site. Um, and that's not the case. When we think about these new flows of data, whether it's the OnStar system in your car that knows how much you weigh and where you go every evening after work, whether it's very highly regulated implantable um, cardiac devices, whether it's the way we type into our smartphones, these are all digital measures of health that provide enormously insightful information. What we have to do is make sure that we harness that information in a way that is valuable, that we harness it in a way that is safe, that is effective for medical decision making and is equitable and brings everyone one with us. So that's the goal of the work here at Data CC, and I'm really glad you posed that question, and I apologize I didn't get to that first. All right. You've all heard a lot from me today, so let me hand the mic. This is an extraordinary panel, um, and I would not do you justice if I tried to introduce you myself, so I'll do a quick whip round. Bray, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself first? Sure. Hi, Bray Patrick Lake. I'm a senior director in the Strategic Partnerships Group at Evidation Health. Fantastic. Welcome, Bray, and thank you for being part of Data CC this year. Celine, go ahead. Hi, I'm Celine Marquez, and I'm Global Medical Director for Digital Technologies at Genentech. Thanks for having me. Um, thank you for being with us, Celine. Ernest, go ahead, please. Uh, I'm Ernie Moy. I'm a general internist, and I'm the Executive Director of the Veterans Health Administration Office of Health Equity. Fantastic. Bray, Celine, Annie, thank you for being with us today. And I think it's a really nice um, sense that folks on the line will get when we look at your respective organizations and your um, expertise of the kind of different view viewpoints we bring together here at Data CC. Celine, I'd love to come to you first. Um, for folks who may not be aware of the Data CC structure, as Annie and I were discussing, it's a longitudinal uh, community. It has a steering committee that helps us identify the most pressing challenges in the field share ideas, best practice, be thought partners, be leaders in the field. Part of that role is to determine what the priorities are that we should be tackling with the kind of action-oriented resources we launched today. Celine, tell us a little bit about um, uh, what are we excited about uh, on behalf of, of the steering committee? What's in the mix vis-a-vis -vis digital health measurement? Thanks, Jennifer. And um, hi, to, hi to Data CC and friends. And um, thanks for allowing me to talk uh, on behalf of the steering committee. Um, we're super excited about coming together to solve these problems that just can't be solved in silos. The, the complexity of the problems requires that. And specifically, we're thinking about how can we ensure that everyone can optimally benefit from this technology. And as a committee, we're, we want to ensure that digital products that are being developed right now are trustworthy. They're deploys in, deployed in ways that ensure that everyone uh, can get access to them and can benefit. And fundamentally that the data that they produce is capable of generating high quality evidence. And you know, this is really critical. We know that with the digitization of medicine, that means that harm might be scaled quickly. And we know that risk, the risk of digital medicine is that it could widen health disparities. So we don't want to leave uh, people behind who might stand to gain uh, and, and benefit from it. And so we saw this play out in COVID. You know, the very devices that we use to triage COVID patients uh, are flawed. Uncorrected pulse oximetry data overestimates arterial blood gas and dark skin. And so we realized quickly that even if somehow we could eliminate unconscious bias, we'd still have this problem of inadequate care for people of color because our devices don't work for everybody. And the data they produced can be system, uh, systematically biased or precisely wrong and scaled. So think about that. Even in the hands of an unbiased practitioner, we can still have bias perpetuated. 
let that sink in. So we didn't come together intending to be a group where we first decided to focus on inclusion, but that is where our data-driven approach led us. And we thought that was the most rational starting point. And, and I'll just say too, uh, sort of double click on what Annie was sharing. It's been really amazing, very cool to see a bunch of different colleagues from all these different types of organizations, startups, tech, uh, farmer, regulars, payers, community organizers. Um, these are all super unique people who love to solve problems at this intersection of medicine and tech and data to improve health. And what's cool is that these hybrid experts like didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, you know, and this is the first large scale mashup of digital inclusion ecosystem and this digital medicine ecosystem. And so, you know, together we're sort of remodeling the approach, traditional approach to digital development and deployment. And we hope this is going to lead we to better patient engagement, better clinical decisions and outcomes for patients. And the potential for this work is super exciting for all of us. Um, it is indeed, and I think everyone's going to get a t-shirt with large-scale mashup on it. That is absolutely phenomenal. But um, Celine, in all seriousness, because these are important topics here, you spoke about the need yes. to be trustworthy. And I remember from some of the workshops, and Annie mentioned the workshops that drove a lot of the materials that we released today, and we talked about what it means to gain trust, right? And we talked about that it's incredibly hard to gain, and it's also incredibly fragile and easy right. to lose. Um, and I'm actually looking at um, uh, Tom's uh, question here in the chat. How are we thinking about those individuals who maybe don't trust these measures yet? We have to be cognizant of that. We haven't lost trust yet in digital health measurement. We are at a very important juncture where we can build it right and when we can bring people with us. So I'm, I'm delighted you brought that up. Um, and I'm, I'm proud that you underscored um, how courageous the team was in insisting that we tackled inclusion first. Celine, tell us what else was on that short list, because while this is critically important, there is more we must do. What else have we been thinking about as a steering committee? Sure. So some of the other topics we looked at were algorithms uh, in digital tools. So in particular, the sort of machine learning flavor, along with kind of all of the sort of prerequisites to trustworthy machine learning. So even if we didn't have this data gap, which we know is it, it created by these exclusive practices and development and implementation of devices, we, in order to have trustworthy machine learning, we need better data standards. We need better harmonization of data, data quality, data privacy, which is non-orthogonal to data integrity and access. So all of these uh, data topics are germane to high quality evidence generation with our digital tools. And I, it's important to, to know because data is not found, it's created. And it's created by flawed humans who decide what data to collect and in what context to collect it. And we design data structures that are acted upon then by algorithms that we have created. So even, in, even if you say, well, okay, computers are now designing the data structures and algorithms. Well, we are still the ones who select the variables to consider in those models and still the ones who decide in what context we're gonna collect those variables. So every single step along the way of these sort of computational process where humans are involved, we have the potential to uh, in, impact and have systematic errors and, and random errors, which can mislead us from the truth. So if we wanna generate you know, high quality evidence with these tools, uh, we have to get the data right all along the data pathway. And so we're in the middle right now of the process of selecting our next topic. Um, so stay tuned for that. Fantastic. Celine, what a terrific overview. And I, it, it, it's all about the data. The digitization of healthcare isn't about widgets. It's about data and it's about information. And I think that is incredibly important. Ray, I'd love to. I, I'd love to come to you. Celine's outlined a tapestry of things that this community needs to dig into over time, and yet we chose inclusion and we chose uh, we chose two simultaneous projects, right? That we hope would be more than the sum of the parts. We didn't just do development or just do the deployment of these tools. We chose both. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I think this was absolutely critical, and we've highlighted a bit of this of, you know, the diversity of our stakeholders, which is incredibly, you know, it's a huge strength of the collaborative, but it just brings together all of these different ends of what it takes to develop a digital health measure um, and product, and then who's actually deploying that, and those are actually two different communities of stakeholders. So what is exciting is that this group 
just kind of slowed down a little and I'll share my background was in uh, running patient advocacy foundations. I later went to acad you know, academic medicine and then I was running large scale national research programs. And I'm very much from the camp of like time equals lives. Let's speed this up. But now I work in health tech and I'm telling you, we live in dog years. So while it is exciting to see everything that's being developed and all the creative minds are bringing solutions to impact some of these great um, and urgent healthcare problems in the US that we have patients in need, it's a little scary at the same time because, um, because of that diversity of lenses. So if you're coming from academic medicine, you probably know about community engagement. You've probably been exposed to that somewhere in your medical program. If you're coming from tech, maybe not. If you're an engineer, um, even if you're working in venture capital. And so I just think it was so important that this community said, let's slow down for just a second and then put together this immense body of work that I'm incredibly proud of. I think this one year and what this collaborative has developed is going to be serving us and saving us really 10 years of not getting it right. So I just think the whole community was like, whoa, 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 like let's step back. And like, if we don't get this right and this is inclusion, then all of the other things that we do are not gonna have the impact that they could. So, yeah. Um, I, right, plus one to absolutely everything you say. And I think that's that's really important, this idea that this had to come first. What we've seen often in our field is we take a half step and then it becomes ossified. Um, we had to get this right straight out of the gate so that we weren't spending, as you said, the next 10 years, the next several decades trying to unwind this and figure out how to bring all of the people we left behind with us. You talked a lot about the terrific decision making of this team to go here first and also to take that breath. Um, and make sure we did it right. Why was this community uniquely positioned to do that? I think we're all like, I just, I love coming to this community because I don't get to interact with these people in my daily job. And so we're all creating solutions, but to be able to say, this is what it looks like from my world, or, you know, this is what it looks like when I take this tool and I try to deploy it within a community, this is what we need, you know, to work with the community to understand their needs. Like these are unique perspectives that you don't get unless you work in a collaborative community like this. And so I just, I feel grateful that this, this community got formed and thanks again to FDA for supporting this. Um, indeed, uh, we are very lucky to have that support. I think it really ensures that we have all of the, all of the brains that we need to at the table to do this kind of work. Annie, I want to come to you. You hold an important um, and influential position at VHA. You are executive di director of the Office for Health Equity. Tell us about your vantage point vis-a-vis um, -vis the use of digital health technologies in improving care and how it's helping um, uh, us be more inclusive and in making sure that every veteran that you care for has access to the highest quality care. Sure. So um, again, it's delightful to be part of this particular activity. Um, in my office, inclusion is everything, um, but I also think that in VA, inclusion is everything as well, because we don't just take care of some patients, we need to take care of all patients, and in truth, many of the issues that we've experienced result from a lack of attention to inclusion. Um, you know, this it affects the digital realm as well, and so in the past, uh, many digital health tools developed at VA uh, did not pay explicit attention to equity. It's not like we said, we're not going to pay attention to this. People didn't think about it you know, 20 years ago that we needed to pay attention to this. It was simply not part of the inputs um, for developing these technologies. And now as we are smarter, uh, we are routinely assessing our tools from an equity perspective. And what we find is they work better for some patients than they do for others. And that is simply not acceptable. These risk algorithms need to work for all of our patients. And so now we have to go back and adjust our models or replace them entirely. And if we paid more explicit attention to digital inclusion during development at the start, we wouldn't be having these kinds of issues now. We will get through them, but it's rework. And I, I hate rework. Um, I like the separation of development and deployment because we experience even more issues you know, from a deployment perspective. Um, explicit attention upfront as these things are being deployed are really important. I'll talk about technology that we have deployed much more recently remote temperature monitoring mats. Uh, we're using those to identify a precursors to pressure ulcers in the soles of veterans with diabetes. If we can detect these um, risk spots early, uh, we can get the veterans to offload from their feet and we can prevent these ulcers from developing entirely. Because these are more common among minority and rural veterans, you know, we thought that we would be helping equity by deploying these mats. And as we started to look at what's happening, what we find is this is true for minority veterans. So minority veterans are receiving 
these MACs at comparable rates to white veterans. And so we think this will help with equity issues, but rural veterans who live further from VA facilities, and we think would probably have the most to benefit from these MACs because of that distance issue, they're receiving MACs at a lower rate than urban veterans are. And this could make these disparities grow larger because you know, we didn't think about how to deploy these um, in the optimal way. We did not include equity in that uh, particular process. And so now we're working to ramp up the use of these maps with rural veterans. Um, and again, if we thought about this from the start, the issue of digital inclusion, if we thought about gathering more input from rural veterans themselves about how we could deploy this more effectively to them, we might have avoided this particular problem. So I do, do really think this inclusion is central to much of the work we do as healthcare providers. And I'm so grateful for this focus on this and the development of these toolkits to help people incorporate inclusion into the development and deployment of these uh, technologies. Um, Ernie, you couldn't have given a better example of why it is not enough to think about developing the perfect tool and or to in a separate silo to think about how we deploy these things, that it, act, it has to be a two-pronged approach. Um, and I applaud you. I, I, I imagine war fighters coming home having kept their limbs intact and the idea that they may lose them due to a chronic condition later in life. Kudos to the hard work you do to making sure that doesn't happen. And certainly I know firsthand, we're very privileged to work with Ryan Vega um, with another partnership within VA. Um, I know how you prioritize access, um, efficiency, equity, um, and effectiveness in everything that you do. Um, Ernie, to round us out, as you look ahead, as you think about the growing um, uh, field of digital health measurement, how do you envisage continuing to employ um, these sorts of tools and technologies in a way that doesn't require rework, that is right out of the gates each and every time? What's on the horizon for you, Ernie? So I think we've learned a lot about uh, this effort, including through this collaborative, but also separately. Uh, the COVID crisis has really brought uh, issues of disparities and equity and inclusion up to the forefront. And we are now trying to readapt our work processes so that inclusion really is upfront. We have full support from our administration and our leadership. Um, and our goal is to integrate it into all the work processes that we do. We should be thinking about equity and inclusion in everything we do uh, from the start to the end to make sure that this, this, this works out. And I'll give an example, I think, which is not specifically digital, but reflects the potential benefits of having this inclusive attitude from the very start. And it relates to a, not a digital technology, but the deployment of a new technology, which was COVID vaccination at VA. And so at the start of the pandemic, um, we saw that uh, our uh, Black veterans and uh, low-income veterans were being affected at very, very high rates. And so we sent our VA researchers to find out what was happening. What happened during the last uh, pandemic, swine flu? What can we learn to apply to this pandemic? And what they found was that during swine flu, uh, minorities and low-income people had higher case rates because of greater occupational exposure. Not their fault. They couldn't avoid it. This is all occupational exposure. And that they had lower vaccination rates. And this was obviously the worst kind of scenario we could envision. And we were determined not to let this happen again with COVID. We were going to do something to fix this. And so we turned to our secret veteran, the secret weapon, which is our veterans themselves. And we convened a panel before vaccination was available of our Black, Hispanic, American, Indian veterans. And we asked them, what can we do? How can we reach you? Uh, how can we reach different groups of veterans to make sure that you get the information you need to make a good decision about vaccination? And they told us they're really two key constructs trust and truth. And we already touched on trust earlier today, but it is central to people using new technologies and including digital technologies. If they don't trust it, they're not going to get it. And so they told us that it, you know, the person, the vehicle is important. They needed to hear information from someone they trusted. And for them, that was a veteran or another VA provider, and ideally someone who looked like them and that they could relate to. Um, for many, this, they had to hear about Tuskegee. So I would talk to them and I would say, you know, Tuskegee was an unethical but people were because people were denied information and treatment, and they were not allowed to make a decision for themselves. And in the case of vaccination, it was the exact opposite. We were trying to make sure all veterans had full information so that they could make the right decision for themselves and their families. And they, they were the deciders, and then VA respected their decision. Uh, they also told us they needed to know the truth. They needed to hear numbers and not rhetoric. They wanted to know that large numbers of veterans were included in the vaccine trials that the effectiveness of the vaccine was high for all groups at preventing disease, hospitalization, and death. Um, and they also wanted vaccination to get be easy, quick, and convenient. 
And in response, VA put out targeted messaging that incorporated all these constructs in print, podcasts, and videos, focusing and targeting outreach to specific audiences. Uh, VA and, uh, will cautioned our providers that need to be attentive and sensitive to inclusive issues as we were talking about vaccination and bringing our veterans in. Uh, we would identify veterans using our database as they became eligible for vaccination so they didn't have to worry about themselves. We could call them up and we can schedule a vaccine appointment right there and at the same time if they were agreeable. Um, we also got special permission to vaccinate spouses and caregivers so we could protect the whole household. The result of this intentionality about inclusion is that our minority veterans are actually vaccinated at a higher rate at VA than white veterans. And I think this is a demonstration of what inclusive deployment should look like intentionality up front and then throughout the whole process and yielding a good outcome. Annie, what a compelling example and congratulations for getting that right. It was so important. And I think you've highlighted something that is incredibly important and a terrific note for us to end this particular discussion on, which is it's about the patients and the people that we are here to serve, right? We have new tools in the toolbox. One of them are digital health measurement tools. That's great, we're excited about them, but ultimately we're not gonna tech our way out of this. We need to work with people, we need to partner with them, we need to recognize them, and we need to remember that the goal of using these tools is to improve their lives. Absolutely terrific. Bray, Celine, Ernie, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for your leadership of the field, for your participation in this Data CC community. We've done extraordinary work here. Bray, as you said, I'm confident these tools are going to change the field. I look forward to driving their adoption and doing much more with you next year. Um, so with that, thank you so much. And I'm going to welcome my colleague, Jean Chung, um, up to the stage here uh, so she can take us on to our next session.